G'day everyone and welcome to a check on chain video update where we're looking at the April 1st sell-off. So my block clock is currently telling me we're at 66,700, um, having sold off from about 70,000 earlier in the day. And the real question is, is the market consolidating or correcting? Is this a healthy moment for the environment? Does Bitcoin actually need to pull back and correct? Um, is the bull market cycle top in? These are all these types of questions that people typically have when we get these sell-offs and even rallies, in fact. Generally speaking, when the price moves by a significant margin, it generally creates a degree of uncertainty. And this is really where data, um, whether it be in the ETF flows, whether it be just price data or looking at it from the on-chain perspective, this is where all of this data can really help us answer these questions. That's what we're looking at today. So let's not kid ourselves. Bitcoin's had a pretty spectacular year to date. Right, so it's rallied from about 42,000 when the ETS went live and actually when the year opened, um, all the way up to 73,000. And we've been consolidating up here for the majority of March. We did break through to new all time highs in early this uh, early March. Um, so, really, after such a spectacular run, as many of you who've been in market for some time will realize, price rarely moves in one direction. It generally needs to take breathers, and these breathers are either consolidations their corrections, and generally speaking, they're very, very healthy. If price just keeps going in one direction for an extremely long time and over a great distance, unfortunately, at some point in time, you do hit a point where it just can't sustain that any further. And generally speaking, the more healthy a rally is, the more corrections, the more pauses, the more breaks, right? If you're a marathon runner, you still need to take a breather. And in many ways, that is what's going on with these consolidations and corrections. So they're very normal. And what we're going to do here is explore this from a few different angles. We'll start with some price and drawdown type metrics just to contextualize things. We are going to look at the ETFs because they're obviously a major part of this cycle. Um, ironically enough, I'm in the camp where I don't think that they're the most unique part of this cycle. And I'll explore that later on when we get there. When we look at things in terms of points of consolidation, there's a series of metrics we can look at to say, well, you know what? It doesn't really surprise us that we're seeing a bit of a pause at this point in time. And the last thing we're going to do is say, is this uptrend actually still quite resilient? Do we really still have the strength? Is the bull market top in? Just trying to put a bit of a framework around some of those topics. So please do like and subscribe to the channel. This is a, a new project, so hopefully you find this and find this useful. Um, uh, do let us know if you have any comments or questions in the uh, in the comment section below. Always happy to answer those. Let's get stuck right into the analysis. Okay, so we're actually going to be using the Check on Chain suite today, which is a bit of a project of mine I've had going for many, many years, but it's finally time to just give it a little bit of love. And what I'm trying to do here is bring up many of the charts and tools and just visualize things in a different way, really get deep and down into the data, um, and also just help visualize things in a slightly different way. Now, bear in mind, this is literally a handwritten piece of HTML file by me, and I am not a web dev, um, so I do apologize that it's not the most beautiful of websites. Uh, it will evolve over time. Nevertheless, where I want to start with today is in the technical and volatility section, I really want to start with drawdowns from all time high, because I think that's got a lot of information. And I also want to look at things in terms of the bull market corrections. You may have seen me cover this chart many times before. Um, and just before we get started, I want to also pull up, where's my price performance metric? Uh, this one here on the one month. And we'll come back to that main page later on. Okay, so starting with the very, very broad picture. So we're looking at this in terms of global market drawdowns. We've got price in red, market cap in orange, realized cap in blue. Now, what I am going to do is just zoom in to our modern history. And the first thing that I want to flag, now that we've reached a new all-time high, we've taken out our 2021 all-time highs. So therefore, we have a new benchmark. We have a new 73,000 odd uh, type uh, all-time high. And you can see that this is actually the 19th of March is the first correction that we had that actually was coming off that peak. Um, and where we are at the moment, on the 2nd of April, we're down about 4.5%. Now, 4.5%, when you look at the price chart and you zoom in, you know, sometimes it looks a bit scary. And generally speaking, corrections do look scary in the heat of the moment. And this is really where I've personally found that data helps me a lot because it helps me understand the volatility. When I understand why things are happening and the mechanics behind it, Hodling becomes a lot easier and actually so too does making decisions and being prepared for what's coming around the corner. So if we look at things in all of our previous all time high breaks here in 2017, here's a 30% correction, here's a 27% correction, here's a 35% correction. 
right? If we look at the 2021 cycle, there's a 25, a 21, a 29. There's a whole bunch of these corrections that we actually get that, you know, this is actually quite typical, right? After you broke into a new all-time high, seeing a 15.2 or in our case, a very scary, ooh, 4.5. These are the types of corrections that we actually expect to see. And these are the pauses and the breaks along the way. The market does need to take a rest every so often, and it does help the market just refine equilibrium before it can move on to the next level. Now, many of you have probably seen this chart floating around. This is one that I created uh, some time back, and really, I, I think it's such, such a powerful chart because sometimes just visualizing data in a different way can give you a great perspective. And this is more or less the same as that last chart, but only looking at price. And what we're doing is isolating the uptrends only. Now, this is easier said than done, right? What is an uptrend? Well, we started building this chart back here in uh, when the FTX lows got put in. We didn't quite know that this would be the bottom, and we can always adjust this chart because, you know, every hindsight is always 2020, but we had a pretty reasonable guess that it was most likely that the FTX bottom was in at that point in time. And it, well, as it stands, it's actually been not only a, uh, a, a you know, that was the bottom indeed, but we've barely had any of those deep corrections. If you look back here in 2016 and 17, this is that zone that we looked at previously. We had much, much deeper corrections on a regular basis, 30%, 25%. Here, the deepest that we had was a 20% back here in September and another one back in March last year. Here we are at 15.2 earlier in the month and 4.5 basically barely doesn't even show up. So as someone like, you know, for me, I've been around the block a couple of times. I've, the story goes, I bought the absolute top here in 2017. Um, so I've seen all of this green and I've seen all of this purple as well as the bear market, right? So looking at a 4.5% correction, it does take experience to people who are getting into Bitcoin, 4.5% in the matter of like an hour, that can be a bit scary, particularly as people coming from the TradFi world. That said, for Bitcoin, this is just kind of another day in the office. So you do kind of get desensitized, but also when you spend time with the data, you kind of get used to dealing with it, right? And you know which tools to look at to, to consult and really get your mind around things. Now, another thing, the reason I want to open up this chart, this is basically just looking at the monthly price candles, right? So basically how did monthly performance go over time? The reason that I wanted to flag this particular chart, we had in uh, in uh, March, sorry, in, uh, in February, we had an 18.8K candle. So the month of February printed an $18,800 candle. That's pretty much the entirety of Bitcoin's price history up until 2017 in a single month, February. We follow that up with an almost $10,000 candle, 9,800. So if you just put this into context, having a bit of a correction and a rest after this, this much price performance really shouldn't be a surprise to too many people. I think that's just a, a good thing to take away is that you don't just get an upwards trending market all the time, even though the narratives can often switch towards, you know, the market's going up forever and this, this cycle can't end and it's a super cycle. The reality is that, that even if that were true, there's going to be pauses and corrections along the way. And it's a good thing to just be aware and prepared for those things as they happen. Now, the next thing that I want to look at is ETF flows. So we're going to look up here. There's two sections you'll find this. Um, the first one is up here near the top, ETF, um, ETF metrics. We're going to look at the overall balances in USD, and we're going to look at the overall flows in USD. Now, in terms of the flows, uh, and actually, before I, uh, I forget, I'll pull up price and volume as well, because that will also be quite useful for us. Okay, so the main thing, what we're looking at here is the total ETF balances. Down the bottom in red, we've got grayscale, and I'm actually just going to change my tool tip to the top one here. Um, we've got grayscale down here in the red, and we've got all of the others, IBIT, FBTC, ARC, all trading higher. Now, I, the only actual uh, uh, metric here that I want to look at is actually GBTC. And we'll just give this a bit of space. The first thing to notice is on the day when all of these ETS went live, they had $28.7 billion worth of AUM. Now, Grayscale has unloaded almost 300,000 Bitcoin. That's a absolutely enormous amount of supply that's been drained out of GBTC. They opened at 28.7, let's give it one extra day, somewhere between 26 and $28 billion in terms of overall AUM, US dollar denominated. Here we are after them unloading 300, almost 300,000 BTC, and they're at $23.3 billion. So even though they've lost an extremely large, I mean, over 1% of the supply that will ever exist will be 210,000, and they're up in the near, to, near 300, 
and they're unloading about $300 million per day at this point in time, they still have $23 billion. This is because the price of Bitcoin has offset. Even though they've seen almost 50% of their supply flow out, the price has just under, right, hasn't quite doubled yet this year, um, but not too far from it. So you've seen this offsetting effect. So it kind of shows that GBTC in terms of dollar value, and this is actually a really important point. The reason why I'm looking at this in USD terms, USD or, or fiat currency is the reference point by which people are buying, whether with their incomes, with their portfolios, whether they're hedge funds, whether they're investors, whatever they are, their benchmark more likely than not is going to be fiat currency. So those $300 million days, if the price, you know, GBTC could in theory unload another 50% of its supply. And if price doubles, their AUM will still be $23 billion. So these are one of these dynamics that the higher the price goes, the more of a weight this GBTC function is. And actually my take on GBTC, it's going to continue to probably see outflows because people want to move coins out of it. And it's probably going to help indicate when pe the sell side pressure, because people don't really want to sell until they think the market's probably done. So GBTC seeing further acceleration as price goes higher, to me, is actually a fairly expected result. It's most likely going to be a supply overhang for the vast majority of this cycle. That would be my gut feel uh, moving forward, simply for these effects. People are going to sell their GBTC before they sell their spot BTC would be my, uh, my way of thinking about it. Now, speaking of all those components, if we look at things in terms of a daily flow, now there's no question, the first three months of these ETFs has been absolutely extraordinary. The flows coming in and we, we saw billion dollar net days, $1.045 billion net days, but multi hundred million dollar days for a string of about two and a half months. Now, two weeks ago, we had a relatively soft week. We had a softening of the inflows into the other ETFs, and we actually had an acceleration. It was about $880 million in total outflows from GBTC. Now, last week we had almost a reversal. So 880 total in net outflows, 840 total of net inflows. Now, the argument is that we this is clearly a softening down. Now, of course, just the same as price. You can't have $100 million days every day ad infinitum. These, this is a very unlikely scenario. These things are always going to go through ebbs and flows. Investors see prices rally too much, and they generally kind of sit back and wait for price to come back to them. So we are going to see this ebbing and flowing. Now, what we're seeing now, granted, this is actually um, only early in this week. Right? We've only had one day of trading thus far. What we're seeing here is that we have had a slowdown for the second, or you could potentially argue third week in a row. Certainly relative to where we were when we hit the $73,000 peak, there is a bit of a softening going on in these ETF flows. So this kind of puts us into a bit of a perspective, right? It, we're seeing a slowdown in the overall ETF flows. Price is also just slowing down a little bit. And remember, the ETFs aren't the only factor, but they also describe a pretty meaningful part of the demand curve. So what we're seeing in spot markets and futures markets and the ETFs generally speak to each other. They're just different subsets, different investors, but they all tend to have a very, very similar mechanic and behavior with all this stuff. Last one on the ETFs, we look at it in terms of price and volume. This is the total trade volume across all of these different ETFs. We can see that price here is correcting or consolidating, however we want to structure this. Thus far, it's more or less range bound. So you could really argue it's more of a consolidation at this point in time, but volume is also starting to peter off. So across the board, we've got just a bit of a slowdown, a bit of, you know, all of this makes perfect sense within that context, right? We are going to get these slowdowns. We are going to get these phased approaches. Um, the last thing I want to look at is what does this mean from an on-chain perspective? And really, this is what most people know by analysis for, trying to introduce that what is really going on within the heartbeat of Bitcoin itself. And really, what is that heartbeat? It's investors. It's people making those decisions based on, generally speaking, their profit and their loss. Now, I'm going to start with the realized price and MVRV. I want to also bring in the short-term holder MVRV. The reason I'm looking at these two is that they're unrealized profit metrics. I want to see how much profit or loss the overall market is in. Now, once we've established that the market is in profit and by what magnitude, are they actually taking it? And this is where we look at the realized profit and loss. I'm going to pull it up in the BTC term because that's going to be relative to previous cycles. I also want to look at the sell side risk ratio. We'll, we'll cover that. It's a bit of a detailed metric. We'll cover that when we get there. And the last one I want to look at is net realized profit loss momentum. So let's boot all these up. 
And this will give us a really nice picture as to why we're seeing this particular moment as a point of correction, consolidation, and taking a breather. Okay, so as I mentioned, the MVRV ratio, now this is one of the oldest on-chain metrics. It's essentially the unrealized profit or loss multiple. Think about all of the coins in the supply, and we're looking at it on a coin basis here. All of the coins, they were acquired at some price. What is the delta between that acquisition price and the current price? That's what we call their unrealized profit or loss. Now, given that we're near all-time highs, the vast majority of folks are in an unrealized profit. And you can actually see that MVRV has actually climbed into this orange zone. Now, why is it orange? I'm just using some very, very simple statistics. All right, we're just trying to really frame up where we are in the cycle. Generally speaking, I think it should be fairly obvious. When things are orange, they're warm, right? We're not near the, the lows of the previous bear. We're much closer to the heights, right? Things are starting to get a little bit statistically overheated. When I talk about this, we're over half a standard deviation from the long-term mean. That basically means we're not extremely overheated. The market has certainly been much higher, but we're getting into a point. Note this orange band in 2017 here. We found resistance. We butted our head against it. 2019, we butt our head against it. As we broke through the all-time high in 2020, similar level. We're getting to those points. In fact, the all-time high back in 2021 by price. We also hit our head on that level. So a lot of these components, the reason why we pause here is that, and you've probably actually felt this if you look at your own portfolio, there's a certain point in time when you go, that's a that's a pretty nice number. Especially if you've been around in the if you've been around the bear and you've been accumulating Bitcoin. Generally speaking, people will say, you know what, that's a that's a pretty big number. And I'll, maybe I'll take 10%, maybe I'll take 5%. Some people will start to distribute their coins. Now, we can actually see this because long-term holders are spending. They've spent something on the order of about 900,000 Bitcoin since December. So we are seeing a very substantial amount of coins getting brought back online. This is the nature of price goes higher and at some price, every hodler starts to distribute. So the fact that we're pulling up into these zones where we've previously hit that resistance and you know corrections happen around this point of time. Another thing I want to highlight, notice that MVRV is, you know, it's volatile, but it's kind of generally grinding higher in 2017. 2023, it's kind of volatile, but it's more or less just grinding higher. 2019 as well, generally grinding higher or 2020. But notice that once you get up into this zone, things get really quite wild and a little bit range bound. Much higher rallies, much deeper corrections. Much higher rallies, much deeper corrections. Same up the top here. Things get more volatile. And this is because people are starting to actually distribute. And the higher the price goes, the more of these sellers start to come online. This is the nature of markets. It's not just Bitcoin. This is for all assets, see these mechanics. We just happen to be able to visualize it really nicely for Bitcoin. If we look at it on the short-term holders, again, unrealized profit or loss, in the early phase, you know, from the bear market all the way through to breaking to new all-time highs, short-term MVRV is typically range-bound up to about 1.6. That means that short-term holders are about 60% profit. They generally start to take profits. And you actually see that we hit those levels. They're generally aligned with these kind of local correction points. Once we get up and above that level, things really start to get pretty toasty. And we hit our head above that level before getting that first 15% sell-off. So again, we're getting to that point where the amount of profit in the system is meaningful enough to people to actually start taking them. Now, really important here, just a bit of a pause. Both the MVRV and short-term MVRV, unrealized profit or loss. Coins that we assume, we know people are in profit, but how do we know if they're actually taking those profits? And that's where we jump to the realized component. Are they actually spending? And we can actually see that we hit the highest realized profit, 352,000 Bitcoin worth. If we bring it up across to BTC terminology. These are points when we have historically hit local corrections, right? There's just a lot of coins that came back to circulation. A lot of these were long-term holder coins as well. So they've been dormant for six months, a year, two years, sometimes even longer. These are coins that the market has more or less discounted as being dormant, right? They've been in cold storage somewhere. They are coming back to life. Now, of course, there's a lot of mechanics here. And I mentioned at the start uh, about the ETFs and, you know, they're not that new because 2019, we actually had, well, for those who are around, this will probably make more sense. There was the plus token Ponzi scheme over in China. 
that absorbed in about three or four months, about 2% of the Bitcoin supply. We had in 2021, GBTC, which vacuumed up 650,000 Bitcoin in like four months. And now we've got the spot ETFs, which have accumulated something more about 800,000 Bitcoin if you include GBTC, about 508,000 if you don't include it, over the course of, you guessed it, a handful of months. We've actually seen this happen many times before in different phases, slightly different characteristics, but GBTC is still spending the same way that long-term holders typically do as we break through the all-time high. The ETFs as a demand vector are functioning much the same as the PLUS token Ponzi back in 2019 and GBTC when it was first growing back in 2021. These are all mechanics that we've seen before and note how the hodlers take increasingly large profits into those events. All of these uptrends, the higher the price goes, the more people take chips off the table. This is the nature of the beast. This is essentially how market structure works. And at some point in time, there's just simply too many coins being sold at too many to too many people over a short span of time. And the market has to then correct, consolidate. That's either a local top, a global top. These things are kind of expected. And that's how it plays out. Now, the last thing I want to just flag on this particular chart, let me zoom in on our current cycle. Notice that we had this initial peak and it is pulling back. This is a good sign. Generally speaking, what you want to see is profits get taken. A local top gets established here at 73,000. The market has to consolidate and refine its footing. It needs to establish, do we belong here? What is the new equilibrium? Where does the price really want to sit? Can we actually absorb this much supply? And what will generally happen is once that market finds that equilibrium, realize profits will decline. We might even get one of these nice little undercuts where people who bought the top actually start to panic sell in a loss. These are generally good signs for dips. It's actually what we want to see during these up cycles. If we jump back to cycle two, which is our 2017 peak, note that our profit and loss at the bottom of these dips, very, very often, you need people to buy the top, carry it all the way down and just capitulate at the lows to very, very reliable signal because people do panic. They buy high, they sell low and then it rallies and they panic buy back to the upside. This is the nature of human beings in markets. It's not unique to Bitcoin. We see it across all asset classes. So generally speaking, you can look at these things. High levels is telling you, hey, there's a lot of coins coming back into circulation in a large amount of profit. When you're in an uptrend, when these things actually pull back and you get these losses, it's generally telling you the people who bought high are now selling low. And these signals are actually even more important when you're in price discovery because the only place you could possibly buy coins in a loss right now is up there at 73, 70,000, right now 69,000, 68,000. These are the kind of price where you had to have bought high and are now panic selling. So watching these metrics actually pulling back is something to just pay attention to, to look for, are we getting a, you know, one of these dip type levels? Or does it actually transition to a really nasty bear where you get these large losses? This is panic. This is when things aren't so good. This is not a normal dip. This is when things are really accelerating and we get the 2022 market that follows. So, all right, so some of these different things you just pay attention to. Now, the last one is sell side risk ratio. Now, this one here is really important. The concept is how big is the market? And the best way, in my opinion, to measure Bitcoin size is its realized cap. If you don't know what the realized cap is, fear not, there'll be plenty of videos I'll be releasing in the very near term to explore it because it's such an important metric. So just sit tight and we will come back and explore the realized cap, but just think about it from the perspective of it's a slower moving on-chain market cap. What we're doing with sell side risk is saying, well, how much of the coins that are moving are realizing a large profit or a large loss? So that's the disturbing force, people who are selling at a profit and trying to disturb the equilibrium or taking a loss because they think it's going lower, disturbing the equilibrium versus the equilibrium, which is the size of the market. So high values, as you can see, we typically hit these high values in bulls, huge amounts of profit taking, people who are taking chips off the table, bringing old coins back into circulation, the probability of being at equilibrium is decreasing the higher that we go and bear markets are essentially the prize at the other end of that story. You can see that every time we get to these very, very high levels, it's typically an extreme blow off event. Now, we didn't quite get to the extreme levels. And mind you, this is actually in logarithmic, logarithmic space. So getting up to this red line is actually quite a significant move. It's more than a 10x uh, from where we currently are. But we did at the 73,000 level 
get into a point where we have just a lot of coins realizing a lot of profit relative to their original cost basis. Now, I mentioned before that pullbacks on that realized profit metric is important. Likewise for this, the lower that this metric goes, the more the market is returning to equilibrium. Very low values means that most people are moving coins very close to their cost basis. There's not a lot of people taking profit. There's not a lot of people taking loss. Equilibrium has been found. Now, of course, we don't necessarily have to get all the way back down to these low levels, but the lower it goes, the more in equilibrium it is. And generally speaking, the lower volatility. Most of 2023, we traded sideways and did absolutely nothing. Some of the most boring market conditions anyone has ever seen in Bitcoin. And as a result, we had very, very stable equilibrium. The market just didn't want to go anywhere until, of course, the ETFs kicked off and away we went. And just to put one final bullet point on this, this kind of lives alongside the uh, the realized profit loss metric. You can see here that as we got these um, these first dips, this is again showing us when we get these points of people who bought high starting to actually panic sell just a little bit, right? And these are kind of those early signs. What you don't want is this thing here to really accelerate and get nasty. You can see that during bull markets, they're typically small, relatively contained. You get a bit of loss. It typically shows you go overheated to one side, cool down to the other side. Overheated to one side, cool down to the other side. Bear markets, very different. Really nasty, really angry and persistent. Remains red for long periods of time. So we've seen a pretty substantial amount of profit taking. We've seen a little bit of a dip to the downside on that first sell-off. This is also starting to cool down, but hasn't yet got back to the neutral level. It makes all the sense in the world for the market to just take a pause, take a break, take a break, reconsolidate. We will see, right? If these ETFs pick up, you know, $100 million days in the near future, whole different ball game, right? That's what demand does. The, the variable in a bull market is we have no idea what the demand looks like tomorrow. That is always the variable. We have a much better view of supply, actually, because we know how much long-term holders typically spend we don't really have a great idea in terms of the demand. Bear markets are actually the opposite. We have a pretty good idea of the demand. The hodlers are a pretty reliable bunch. We can kind of measure how much demand they have near the bottoms. What we don't know is how many people need to capitulate and actually oversaturate the markets. We don't know the supply during a bear. We have a much better view of the demand. So where we currently are, the demand remains the variable. We kind of have an idea of the supply. We are still seeing those coins getting distributed. These are just some of those things to keep in mind. So a correction right now makes perfect sense. Within the context of historical bear markets, you kind of got to put your binoculars on and say, what correction? Um, but of course, everybody's used to the market cycles that they're used to. And those of us have been around for a long time, 5%, 10%, 15% drawdowns. Um, sometimes you don't even notice these things are happening. But uh, nevertheless, hopefully you found this kind of a, a useful overview. There's a lot of content here, a lot of material. We'll explore all of these ideas in, in more detail. Um, certainly keep tracks of the uh, of this channel. We'll be launching more and more videos and more and more content from this, um, and particularly going through my really my bread and butter metrics that I pay attention to all the time. So this is a bit of a big picture overview, just to kind of introduce you to some of the tools and metrics I look at. But uh, we'll be exploring and breaking these down in a lot more detail moving forward. So anyway, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you found it useful. I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers. <laughs>